If you could please sit down, we're about to start. Thank you. So this, uh, this session is called Two Ships. I'll not uh, say too much right now because there's still people who are coming. I'm going to give you about two minutes to arrive and then we're going to get going. As you can see, there are in fact two ships and you're going to learn all about those two ships very shortly. What I will say is that this, uh, this painting is in this space because John Ralston Soul and our CEO saw it in Kent Monkman's studio and said, wow, we have to have that for Six Degrees Citizen Space. It's not a canvas that is part of the AGO collection. It is a canvas that was, is, is in fact still being finished, which is sort of cool. It's a work in progress still. Um, and we are honored to have it grace our wall. And um, no shortage of emails back and forth to uh, figure out the mechanics of getting it here. It's quite fun. All right, I think we're all ready to go mostly. I'll give you 30 more seconds. So the way this session is going to work, just so you know, is we're going to start with a conversation uh, with Kent and then um, we will basically add two uh, and then a third uh, person on the audience or on the stage, sorry, so that we'll, we'll be adding to the conversation. But within the conversation on the stage, please do feel free to ask questions. I will be roving on the microphone. I'm happy to come around to you, okay? So it's both a conversation from the stage and also a Q&A in the audience. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce the director of the Art Gallery of Ontario, Stefan Joost. Thank you very much for being here. Again, I'm Stefan Joost. I'm the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. We're um, a kind of sprawling institution. We're always revising history here, too. And we tell histories we all know, and we're also encouraging, perhaps, different histories. Um, it's my pleasure to um, have Two Ships by Kent Monkman here, and there's three different versions, and, and it's not yet part of our collection. Um, Kent really um, is mindful of art history, and I don't mean that casually. He's extraordinarily knowledgeable about the history of art. He's also mindful of social histories and also his personal history. So you have three histories working simultaneously, and his project is nothing short of epic. He's using narrative history painting to basically rewrite the history of painting, which isn't easy to do. Um, it's been a massive project, and he does it through artistic excellence. He does it with boldness when it comes to the truth, perhaps in telling stories that we may not want to know about. Um, and he also does it with an incredible sense of humor, all three of them working pretty well together. Joining him on stage is Wanda Nanabush, who's the AGO's assistant curator of Canadian and Indigenous artist, uh, art. And I would say Wanda is um, best known internally and externally as a cultural warrior. So I'm going to have them both join us on stage. Thank you, Stefan. I'm sure you enjoy my warriorship all the time. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Uh, really happy to be here this afternoon. Thanks for coming to the session, and welcome, Kent. Uh, so we are here to discuss an unfinished painting that Kent has hung here. And um, I, I'm so pleased to be hosting this conversation. I am not Sarah Milroy. Sarah Milroy lost her voice, so I had to step in for her. Um, 
And I also want to thank Six Degrees for having us all here. We are live streaming at the Cedar Bray, York Woods, and Toronto Reference Libraries. Uh, and any, any, all of you simply attending via live stream, thank you for being here as well. We're very lucky to be in the presence of this painting and such an exceptional artist. A bit of background about the two ships and how it came to be here. Um, John Ralston yeah, Saul and Charlie Foran, they went to your studio, I believe, and saw some studies. Uh, it was about 20% complete at the time, and they really felt it was important as narrative, as art, as a visual metaphor for the historical, political, cultural, and perhaps spiritual moment we are all in together. And we are going to uh, talk a little bit about those aspects of the painting in a minute. First, I want to talk a little bit about the structure. So uh, shortly, Kent and I will have a close-up conversation about the creation of the work. Then we're going to invite, and here it says me, to the stage, but I'm already here. Um, <laughs> and then we're going to invite uh, Bernard Schlink, who has a particular interest in European romantic and political art. And we're really happy you're here to come and share your thoughts on Kent's painting. And finally, John Ralston Saul will join us on stage um, to contribute his thinking to this work. Uh, we will have time in between, two times, to be able to discuss with the audience as well. So get your questions ready. Um, but to start, uh, I want to I ask you, Kent, um, maybe where you begin and why such, maybe such a huge painting. <laughs> what were you thinking? Good question. Um, <laughs> does this, is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, You're good. You're good. It's on, yeah. You just it's have definitely to definitely really... on. Okay. Um, all right. Well, this project began um, about three years ago, and it was uh, a commission that I pitched to um, some American collectors that were buying my work for the Denver Art Museum, and um, very, very, very good collectors. And I wanted to make a very large history painting. And so I pitched them on the idea, and they, they accepted the commission. Um, and I got started on it. And uh, like most of my um, paintings, it began with a little sketch. So I did a little thumbnail sketch, probably not any bigger than that. We can show the sketch, actually, if you want to see it on the screen here. And uh, the, um, the collectors agreed to the commission. Now, subsequently, um, you know, there, there, uh, there was some, some illness, and they weren't able to follow through with the commission. So if anyone has a very large living room, <laughs> this Monkman is, um, will be available soon. John, do um, you have a wall for it? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The next step in this, in this project, I'll come back to the, the intentions and the whole concept after. I'll just talk a little bit about the process first. The next step was to uh, translate this, this little pencil uh, sketch to the small study size, which I, which I did over six weeks, uh, about two winters ago. Again, we have the um, images. There we go. Yeah. And um, I've been working with assistants in my studio for about 10 years, uh, painting assistants. And um, we... Uh, we took this image and we projected it um, to that size and we realized that there, there, there wasn't enough information in the, uh, in the study to help my assistants make the work. And uh, up until you know, pretty recently, um, I was doing all the figures myself and I thought, oh my God, like I'm going to be painting this thing for 10 years. Um, so what we decided to do, and we already started doing this in my studio practice, was uh, bringing models in and photographing them, and then I could give my, my assistants um, better source material. And it actually gave me better source material, too. Let's so I ended up having image. much better source material to work from as a painter. And I'd always resisted, you know, um, using photography, I guess because I felt it was like cheating or something, you know, because I'm such a purist when it comes to painting. but. You know, when I really thought about it, as this, this is kind of, you know, it's an homage to French painting, and specifically to Delacroix, and I'll talk a little bit about, about his process, but, um, you know, Delacroix was using uh, photographs and working from, from photographs of models. So I thought, okay, you know, it's okay, I can work with, uh, you know, models now. So what we did was we brought models in and we, we uh, staged uh, a shoot uh, and, and got costumes and, and got the models into my studio and basically recreated uh, the scene well, not all together, but in bits and pieces. And that furnished the source material for the second study. 
Now, the first one was already underway, and it was, was kind of um, in, in progress, well, well, you know, several months into it, and so we kind of took a step backwards, painted over the areas that had been started so we could sort of, um, you know, update it with this, this new information. You know, as you can see, my assistants work from iPads now. So we have, uh, we have this uh, system in my studio, which is kind of very much like the, the uh, atelier system that the old masters would use in terms of uh, me giving a lot of direction to so my you gotta team. you got to hold it like this. i got to hold it like this. Or nobody will hear a word you're saying. And um, so uh, this, this work here, as you can see, it was, uh, it's still um, in, in process. And I was uh, at first a little bit reluctant to reveal an unfinished work. But um, I like the idea that it was going to be here in this uh, studio environment. Um, and that it was, it sort of fit this, I, the idea of this uh, forum, you know, we're all sort of works in progress and we're all sort of like um, working towards um, improving and, and, and coming together. So um, you'll see a lot of Naples yellow underneath uh, the, the painting here and that's, that's, a, that's a technique I got from Delacroix. So I read his journal and, you know, he talked a lot about color and there was a lot of really uh, useful information in, in Delacroix's journal just about painting. But I wanted this piece to really speak to um, the relationship of Europeans and indigenous people. And I love French painting, so in many ways it's an homage to a number of French painters. Um, and the, the, the image is based on you know a reading or the interpretation of the two row wampum uh, treaty, which is the, the one the oldest basically treaty between the in indigenous people, uh, the Iroquois and, and and the Dutch. So dating back to sixteen the sixteen hundreds. So one of the first, and then from from that treaty, other treaties are are based on that. So it's kind of foundational in terms of how indigenous people understand our relationship to European uh, peoples. So. The idea, the image, I was really drawn to the image that it evoked because it was two, two rows of purple wampum beads symbolizing uh, the course of two vessels, you know, an, a European ship and, and an indigenous canoe traveling in a parallel course and not interfering with each other. So the idea really was a peace treaty. And as we know, you know, uh, the, the treaties have been misinterpreted the way indigenous people understood the treaties when they signed treaties or when it, whenever there was a treaty made, there was a very specific idea that indigenous people had in mind, which of course was... You know, Peace and friendship. Or the sharing and sharing of, sharing of the land, sharing of the resources. So, um, and you know, Europeans understood that as, uh, uh, you know, that they were signing over, you know, millions of acres or, or what have you. So I wanted the, the, the painting to really feel like that moment of where these two vessels are about to collide. And it, um, you know, it's a, it's a seascape, it's a stormy, turbulent um, scene. And uh, there's a number of different references, so. Yeah, one I was thinking, um, and for those of you who don't know, the two row wampum, it's 1613. <laughs> but this is, um, I was, when I first saw it, I was thinking of the raft of Medusa immediately for the, uh, the Jericho painting. And also partly because in that painting you have this very ambiguous moment where the ship is coming, it could save them, but it also might not be saving them. And that kind of ambiguity, and I was wondering if you were drawing anything from that painting into this. Absolutely, and you know, I, uh, well, I'll talk a bit about some of the other citations in the work and, and just kind of uh, stitch together. I, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm always a bit reluctant to, you know, say too much about the work because okay. you know you want people to sort of see things and interpret their own uh, their own things from the work but um, <clears throat> there's um, a number of different sort of characters on that on that raft it really is a shipwreck um, that represent different uh, you know personages uh, from European uh, history historical characters and, and mythological characters um, the canoe itself I was I was looking at uh, Bill Reed's spirit canoe actually uh, for, uh, mm -hmm. for inspiration from that, but also Delacroix's Christ at Sea. And that sort of, when I thought about Delacroix's Christ at Sea, that sort of gave me um, the, the rationale to uh, put mischief in that boat because, you know, the parable of Christ at Sea was that, you know, here is this um, leader and his disciples and he's fallen asleep and the, the stormy sea is threatening to sink the ship and they're all terrified and they, they, you know, meanwhile, he's blissfully asleep. So I kind of saw this as, you know, mischief's wet dream. 
And <laughs> this is a, you know, she's having this dream and uh, she's maybe about to wake up. So when she wakes up, does she, you know, does she calm the storm? So that was the, this idea of, of a storm brewing or potentially about to destroy, you know, what, what is happening. But there is this, you know, incoming moment where she is going to wake up. So that was kind of, and then there's a number of uh, uh, references in the, in the canoe there to uh, Bill Reed's Spirit Canoe, but also to um, Paul Kane, a, a painting by Paul Kane. So when I was thinking about how can I represent, you know, the West Coast uh, cultures, I went, actually went back to Paul Kane's uh, uh, painting, um, Medicine Mask Dance, which was very much uh, about uh, his artistic license and sort of bringing masks that didn't belong together together to, to make up uh, this this image. So um, that's really what I love to do, though, is to uh, to quote from art history and to sort of you know cr uh, bring images together that can kind of stitch together uh, these references. Um, Miss Chief in the boat uh, is is also um, uh, referring to a painting by Giraudet, which is uh, Sleeping Endymion. So uh, Diana was kind of bathing his body in, in moonlight, and so there's a kind of a a sexual gaze on the body as well. So um, it's, it's probably going to be another six months or more until it's finished, but it will be uh, premiering at the uh, Canadian Cultural Centre in Paris. There's a new space that they are um, launching in May of 2018. So if anyone is in Paris in, in 2018, that will be the official launch. I, and I, I'm, don't tell Catherine Bedard anybody because I was supposed to be holding the, the premiere for that. <laughs> but it's not finished, so I can get away with this, right? Yes, and it is in a gallery school, so we're okay, I think. Um, it's interesting, uh, you were talking about this kind of relationship to French painting and Delacroix and also being at the Cultural Museum in Paris, and I remember the last time I was there, I was with Robert Houle, who was studying Delacroix and also did work for there. Um, what do you think our relationship is to Europe in this way, as artists? Well, I mean... Uh I make history paintings like this because it's such a, it was such a grand tradition of painting. In many ways, it sort of reached its zenith in the 19th century. And, and you know, as I, as I track art history, I'm looking for how art history has portrayed indigenous stories or has not portrayed them. So the relationship that indigenous people have had with, you know, the French, I mean, it goes back a long time. And indigenous people were traveling to Europe. Um, for a number of different reasons. And uh, Delacroix, for instance, uh, sketched some of the indigenous people that were, were traveling through, uh, through, through Europe with George Catlin. So there's a long history of indigenous people going and looking at Europeans. And a lot of my work is about that reversal of gaze, uh, you know, using this, you know, using idioms of, of art history, of, of, of romantic painting, of history painting to talk about these, these back and forth relationships. You know, it's, it, it has never been just a one way uh, relationship. Um, and uh, so I think I, I, I just love um, the, the richness of uh, pictorial history that can, can um, tell stories. And uh, so I've really kind of um, moved away. I, I used to work more abstractly, and I, I decided that I wanted to work with a language of painting that was much more um, complex in terms of uh, the, the, the layers that I'd be able to bring to the work. Yeah, there's a funny story about, uh, actually close to here, the Mississauga of New Credit, one of their members, Mungwadas, had traveled to, to France in like 1847 to, he became one of Delacroix's um, studies. And uh, he wrote an, a book about his experiences and he just, they couldn't get over how hairy the French were. So it just <laughs> tells you a lot about, you know, these first kind of meetings, and, right? And he was and shocked he, that they couldn't, uh, well, they weren't taking care of their poor people. Yes, so this was the most shocking the, thing. The amount of wealth and then the disparity between, you know, the, the, the wealthy and the poor. Yeah. So let's go back for a second to this idea of the two ships. Um, we have the European ship and we have an uh, indigenous ship in the original wampum that was done, um, and they're traveling in, the, in parallel directions. So at the time, there was this belief that that's where we would be, you know, that there, the one principle of non-interference means that nobody can put their laws on another people. So now we, here we are today in a, uh, what's often called the time of reconciliation or something like this. Um, do you see this work making a comment on that in some way? 
Well, if you go back to the original treaties, they were made between sovereign nations. And what's happened subsequently is that um, that relationship, you know, the, the Crown kind of um, uh, shifted their responsibility to the Canadian government. So those treaties really don't uh, hold up because they were between sovereigns. And when you have people uh, like Chief Spence, who, you know, during her protest in Ottawa, wanted to speak with the governor general is because she wanted to speak legitimately with the sovereign who her treaty is with. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, these, these are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm making a painting like this because I really want people to think about those trees and how, how they're interpreted. Right, and yours is a shipwreck, so what does that say? <laughs> well, I, I love, I love the, the, the richness of, of, of uh, the, the allegory of, of these ships um, about to collide and, and um, you know, just two ships passing in the night. Um, it's... For me, it was just a fertile terrain that could sort of layer the image and, and uh, you know, um, give it complexity. Who are some of the figures that are on the raft or the Well, ship? you know, I mean, I, I, without identifying, you know, or, or really trying to close it off, I mean, there's someone that maybe could be Columbus. There's someone that maybe could be Queen Victoria. Um, you know, uh, there's Liberty kind of in there. There's a Viking... Uh, there's a minotaur who is sort of Napo like Napoleon, um, you know, so I was trying to integrate uh, mytho mythologies as well, you know, how, how indigenous people sort of think about, you know, co the cosmology and, and how Europeans have their own, um, you know, myth mythical characters. And uh, so those are kind of present in, in, both, in both ships as well. I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions as well, because I'm sure you have many. You've been staring at it for a couple days. So are there a couple of questions from the audience at this point? OK, there's one over here. I'm just going to pass you the box, and you will stand up. You're ready to catch. Giselle. This is, gave me a lot of anxiety, because I was terrible in sports. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Kent, uh, would you like to talk about what Miss Chief is doing in the canoe? Well, she's asleep and um, she's dreaming and uh, ostensibly it's an erotic dream because in the small studies she has an erection. So, so that's why I call it kind of a post? wet dream. <laughs> <laughs> this is post-erection yeah. moment? Well, it, it, I didn't. I, I haven't added it yet to the large uh, study. I was. I was worried at, at 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 how big it might be at this scale. So I didn't want to scare anybody off. So uh, come back and see it in Paris when it's finished. Do, do we have another question? Mm -hmm. There. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. You ready? It, it, it relates to that concept of scale uh, and size. Uh, so I, can you talk about creating something of this size and how that changed your approach to the work? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's certainly the largest painting I've ever made, and I probably will never make a painting this big again because uh, it's a real pain. Um, even just moving this painting here, I mean, uh, you, <laughs> the organizers can tell you <laughs> there are like hundreds of emails sent and the logistics of, 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 a, of you know, just handling a painting like this. It had to come off the stretcher um, and then, um, you know, I work with the Skyjack. I don't know if the Skyjack is in the, in the, in the pictures of my studio, but, um, you know, I have a Skyjack in there. And, and like I said, I've been working um, with a team directing people. It's just... Uh, it's an enormous uh, amount of work. It's probably, you know, it's, it's like four or five times uh, what I normally do. Um, and, uh, but it's also, I, the reason I wanted to make it that big was, you know, history paintings typically are very large and they have an impact and they really give you that sense of awe about what the, the narrative is because they're so big and you can kind of lose yourself in them. So, you know, the raft of the Medusa at the Louvre is 14 feet tall. So mine is actually two feet shorter. Uh, it's not quite as wide, but um, I like that two to one ratio. Uh, and that seemed to fit the, the concept of, of the piece as well. Um, but yeah, there's a real shift that has to happen in terms, even in terms of the brushes, you know, like the brushes are like this big, you know, for, for part of the painting. So it's a real learning curve for myself and for, for my team. and. Um, it's also just been a really great challenge, but I'm, uh, it's just been in the studio too long, so I really, really need to get it done. 
one of the interesting things, because it is a, so, a so-called history painting, Don't but history anyway. always in, in the sense that includes well, fiction to a certain degree, because you're including people um, who never would have existed in oh, the same oh, place and okay. same time, and it sort of reflects back onto history painting and sort of draws attention to the fact that that's true of most of the history painting that we sort of take as truth, like the death of General Wolfe or something like that, you know, where people paid to be at his bedside in the, or his death side in the painting. So I want to bring up uh, Bernard. I would love for you to head up here and uh, join this conversation. Uh, coming from Germany as a writer, an art historian, and a jurist. We really want to know what you think. <laughs> I'm really not an art historian. Uh, <laughs> but let me begin by, there are several reasons why I'm grateful for having been invited here. And one is that it got me in contact with your work. And when I learned that I would see these paintings of yours here, first I saw them on the internet, it was good, but seeing them in print was already better. And now this is really, this is really wonderful. And I love German 19th century art. So if ever you come to Berlin, don't miss the Alte National Gallery, where this art is beautifully presented. And I love paintings that tell stories and particularly paintings that tell stories that I don't fully understand. It's the same with poetry. I love poetry that I don't fully understand. So I, uh, as with your four continents, I have looked at them again and again, and I know and like Tiepolo's four continents. It's something that I can look again and again and get into it deeper and deeper. Here, I also don't understand all the references and all the iconic people that you Canadians immediately understand. Well, what I see is two ships. And the left one, I mean, it can't even be steered, this poor ship. It can just go where the wind drives it. And right now, the wind drives it into a collision with the other ship no way out of the situation un unless the canoe turns sharply to the right and it doesn't look like it's going to do that so two ships i don't see them as parallel but on a collision course and the people the poor white people they could need a little more sun i mean <laughs> their gray white skin compared to these healthy indigenous people over there but if you look at the faces, they don't look that different. And here, the guy put a boar's head on his head, and there is a mask. So there's a similar sense of being and hiding and presenting oneself and not presenting oneself. And what I particularly like, it's a confrontation on all levels. So they want to shoot at each other, they want to greet each other, they see the beautiful naked women here and there, they are dressed or not dressed, so they communicate on many, many levels. And John, at the last round, talked about the uh, indigenous social model or models and I can even see this in it so <laughs> the white people seem somewhat lost on their ship they can't steer they are much less together among each other than the indigenous people over there and the indigenous people can row their boat they can give it direction what these poor guys seem unable to do so maybe it is even something about different models of being together in a difficult situation. OK, so for many reasons, I love it. The story that I understand and the stories that I don't understand and that invite me to look at it as other words, the four continents, again and again. 
So thank you for this painting. Thank you. That's a very high compliment. Um, I'll, I'll just add a, a little note, because you know, for me, painting, you, you never really know. Even though I, there's this process, you don't really know where it's where it's leading you. And and one of the the discoveries for me in in making the painting w was about the the parallels that happened with the things they were wearing on their heads. So, and that didn't happen. I wasn't really aware of it until after I'd made my first study. You know, and then. You're, at first, you're aware of all of the differences, and then you start to see the, the similarities. So that was something that was a, kind of a, an interesting discovery for me in making the work. And then uh, with, the, with how it's going to be exhibited in Paris, uh, I'm going to be um, curating uh, head, head pieces from a museum in Lyon, and we'll be showing those with the works uh, t to show indigenous he head uh, dresses and um, European helmets and things like that, just to kind of create these, you know, these parallels uh, to, to emphasize the similarities as well as the differences. Um, <clears throat> just hold it like this. But um, what what happened? Or I was sort of curious about something you were saying, where it almost sounded like you were saying one of the ships could rescue the other, maybe, or is that some of where you were going with some of your thinking around one being a healthier kind of situation than the other? Well, I mean, the collision can only be avoided if this ship turns sharply to the right. And this ship, at least, is able to steer. This one is just driven by the wind wherever it blows. So, yes, the, the active element is on the right. The more passive element is, is on the left. Do you have something to say about that, Kent? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it makes you feel? <laughs> um, it, that wasn't some of your intention, though. With no, I mean, yeah, sure. Of course I was thinking about that. Um, you know, um, I, I wanted the indigenous vessel to, to, to uh, have agency and power and to, to, to be mobile and, and moving. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not black and white either. I mean, there are people mm -hmm. in that uh, canoe that want to assist and those that don't. So... You know, I think it's important to have work that's also uh, uh, explores a different range of, you know, possibilities. Not cl not to not close it off for interpretation too easily. Yeah, it doesn't feel easily. binary for sure. Um, what happens when you when what do you think about when you're placing these kinds of different things together, like a mask, indigenous mask, and a helmet from from another culture? Well, like I said, I, I was really trying to just represent, uh, you know, almost, um, you know, iconic uh, characters from uh, the European, uh, in the European vessel. Um, those, those parallels just sort of happened um, almost by accident through the creation of the work. You know, using uh, the indigenous mask, it, was, it, was, it, it began as an homage to Bill Reed's spirit canoe because he had r Raven in the canoe and there's a bear and... Uh, a wolf, and so I wanted those uh, characters present, um, and then uh, I kind of, you know, winked at Paul Kane for his, you know, appropriation of uh, indigenous masks. Um, so it was a way to kind of also bring the story back to, um, you know, how Europeans have lensed indigenous cultures and the problems that lie in the art history that is here in North America and in Europe about who indigenous people are. And so much of my work is about how museums represent indigenous people. And uh, so a lot of my work is working with museum uh, representations and collections and that kind of thing. Um, we have a question from the audience quickly. Did you have a question? Yeah, Hi, good afternoon. And thanks for sharing the painting. I, I'm just curious, I don't know if, if it was intentional, but I'm, I'm seeing in, in the raft that the man with a kind of Roman helmet and the other man that looks like a kind of, could it be Spanish conqueror, are the only one looking at the Minotaur that you equaled to Napoleon, and the other ones are looking the other, other way, so I don't know if there's a message be behind that, or it's Possibly. pure? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't help but notice that. 
I'm sorry. Well, you know, one of the things, again, when it comes to creating a composition like this is you want to um, create um, relationships with all of these, you know, f characters and figures within the painting so that, you know, you, you're, you're making stories within stories. And, and for me, it was about, you know, again, studying these great paintings and, and, and really analyzing what made these, you know, the paintings that I admire so much, what made them so fascinating. And that's what the old masters were so good at, was storytelling with the human body. Very subtle things like how someone would look at another person and how grief could be portrayed in the human body. And so those are things that I've really looked at and really learned from in my own practice. And I always come back to it. And, and, and most, my most recent body of work um, that uh, um, is touring Canada right now in the Shame and Prejudice thing was really about understanding you know, how emotion is so important to a, a, a narrative painting or a represent, representational painting. That element of emotion is, is an important layer that I really wanted to, um, to develop in my practice. I think he wanted to respond again. Yeah, I, I only was uh, referring to uh, military power and uh, uh, political imperial, so to speak, power. Because they, they're only one like interacting directly. And if it has something to do with, I don't know, some kind of Western way of doing politics for, for centuries. Yes. That, that, that's where the, 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 the question no. came from. <laughs> Please. You just have to hold the mic to, against your chin. But it leaves so much space for the viewer's imagination because even though it's serious and political and critical, it's at the same time it's funny and playful and ironic. And so, uh, as I see it, even though there may be Columbus or Napoleon or whoever, and <laughs> we remember all the things that they did, we are not bound to that. We can, as viewers, also play with all these things, and you invite us to play with them. Absolutely, and and uh, so, not not every layer has to be understood by every viewer. That doesn't matter to me. And uh, so, the art history geeks are going to really enjoy it, maybe a little more than some other people. But that's what it, I think. You know, the power of representational. Uh, image making, as I've learned as I moved away from abstraction, was how wide my audience could be. And I realized that the, the things that were important to me, I needed to reach a wide audience because you're, you're, you're going to have a very circular, closed conversation if you're only speaking to your own community or your own uh, microcosm, you know, in the art world. Like for me, it was really about reaching people that don't know anything about art history, reaching uh, the European settler cultures that we live in, and then the Europeans who live in Europe, and you know, because this is part of their his art history tradition, so they can instantly recognize, you know, the citations and 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 the, the references, and so for me, it was about trying to reach a, a, a wide as an audience as possible. And Miss Chief sure likes to be played with. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we have a question over here. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a question and also a, a comment. Um, so as I, as I look at the piece, I, I think about how the interplay between um, the narrative that has to be created for settler populations to interact with indigenous populations, regardless of where they are in the world. Some of that narrative that plays out in, in mythology and iconography ends up needing to infantilize the iconography and mythology of indigenous communities so that a settler community can explain its own um, clinging to a superior, a superior narrative. So when I look at some of the, the mythical um, um, creatures of folks on the raft and how we've come to understand those as essential foundations of history and, and classical civilization, and the ones on the, in the canoe as playful and play things of a less evolved or less uh, complex civilization. Um, so it, it, it doesn't jump out as them being parallel. It doesn't seem to me that the narrative is parallel or equal to use that term. That's my comment. Um, well, that's an interesting perspective. Um, Wanda, do you want to speak to that one? <laughs> well, I think um, 
historically, this is the narrative that is told, right? That indigenous people are treated as lesser civilization, all this kind of thing. And the iconog iconography uh, for sure can look like that. And for sure, our art practices um, sometimes circuit through Western art and circuit through its concerns. But I actually think what Ken's, Ken's trying to do is circumvent that entire narrative entirely. So like to resituate power within an indigenous context and to resituate European art from an indigenous perspective such that it's not a binary nor is there a hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, Europeans came here and, and they created, uh, you know, the, the foundational myths of Canada and the U.S. are flawed in that, you know, they, they came and they conquered and, and it's, uh, it's about European uh, supremacy here. Um, but, you know, that's just purely through the lens of, of the European eye. Um, you know, from an indigenous point of view, you know, a canoe makes way more sense than uh, a different kind of vessel on this landscape. So, uh, it, again, it's all in, in the eye of the beholder and how, how, how you perceive it. I mean, I've had indigenous people um, look at my work and, and especially ones that are, you know, uh, of landscapes. And, and what they see is very different from what a European would see, just in terms of understanding what they're looking at. You know, the mountains are our ancestors, our grandfathers, and you know, there's a very different cosmological way of, of just understanding what you're looking at. And I think indigenous people will read my work differently. And I think, again, it comes back to uh, a language that is very open and can, can be read by different people uh, uh, with different perspectives. John, I wanna bring you up here at this point. Um, join us. I'm sure you have some words on the history of this country and its representations. <laughs> well, I mean, I w is that, yeah, that's on. I, I should just admit first that um, uh, I'm a big fan of Ken's and have been for some years, and he did my, it sounds really strange, but he did my official portrait for Rideau Hall. And uh, so it's the first official well, portrait well, well. in Rideau Hall. <laughs> and those official portraits go back to, um, well, the earliest thing there is sort of about 1850. And it's the first one done, obviously, by an indigenous uh, artist and one of the greatest artists in Canada today. And um, we did have a number of interesting conversations about whether Miss Chief should appear in the official portrait. I tried. <laughs> he, put a, he made a big attempt, but, you know, <laughs> there are moments. <laughs> Would you have been sitting on Miss Chief's lap? I could see that. Well, everything's possible, you know? Everything is possible. Uh, there was a lot of balancing in kayaks, if you like, and um, <laughs> in very cold wa with very cold water if you fell out, <laughs> if I remember rightly. But it's a wonderful portrait. I have, not because it's me, but because it's him. It's a really wonderful, and people love it there. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is I, um, I actually don't agree, if, if, if I'll be even blunter, I, I don't actually agree with the idea that the... Um, indigenous mass are somehow playful or lesser. And I think that there's been an enormous move in the you know, art history, the understanding of, of indigenous objects over the last 100 years uh, to where people actually treat these objects almost with more uh, nervousness and care than they do Western images. I mean, you only have to look at the agreement in the what's now called the Museum of History in Ottawa, where the rooms with certain masks have to be in darkness and you can only look at them through slats because elders have said these must not be exposed to light. So there's an agreement in the art history world in Canada that, uh, and I'm just being very limited here, in the art history world in Canada, that indigenous uh, uh, objects must be treated in a way which is understood to be correct so that for example uh, the the whole argument about whether totem poles should be saved which is the european idea to, as relics or whether according to the elders and and the nations they should be allowed to return to nature which is a different philosophical attitude towards the relationship between people and nature that 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 argument went on for how long on it for about 20 years or 30 years something <coughs> longer and in the end, indigenous people won the argument. And it was, it was decided one of the greatest sites in the south of Haida Gwaii. It would, the, the, the Haida would decide what happened to them. And there's, I saw them 25 years ago, and they're slowly rotting away. So they have not been neutralized as objects in the European sense. They've been allowed to return to nature. And 
people like Hunt and in terms of the other names, the great sculptors of our day out there, are building new ones, right? I think that was part of the, the two points, one that you're making around the, the world view is completely different, so it's not an object, it's a spirit, it has a life, all this kind of thing, especially if they're feasted. Um, but also another thing you're pointing out is that if a culture continues to practice and produce and change, then the, that so notion of preserving becomes less, import, less necessary in that way. So it's coming out of that whole salvage kind of ethnography that was like, we are going to pass off into the distance yeah. and we will die out. Yeah, but so here it's we are, actually sitting a, here today, yeah, it's not a real, dead, I mean, not dead. You know, what you're doing is a real, and this decision is a real defeat for the anthropologists, you know, and, and the, 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 the social Darwinists and all the rest of it, who said, isn't this wonderful stuff that we can stick in museums and it's all over, and instead of that, it's... You know, you could argue that you know some a great number of the most important artistic explosions in this country over the last 50, 60 years have been indigenous, and um, uh, and there are a whole and of which Kent is, is one of the most important contemporary ones. And I think this painting is a, a remarkable, a remarkable thing. And you know, I can't remember who said it, but it, it was Kent who said it. I mean, Canada is the only colonial creation where when the imperial powers came, they were unable to impose European means of transport. So this is the only country where they couldn't really use horses much until they got to the prairies. The wheel was totally useless. Uh, you know, try a wheel in the Canadian Shield. You've got 15 seconds before it breaks, you know? And so that actually the Europeans were obliged to, with indigenous people, use the canoe and we used the canoe in forms of the canoe up until we did the railways. And the roads came third. This is this, the, one of the maybe only countries where the roads came third, not second. And so, you know, up until the 1860s, 1870s, it was still the water, the rivers, and canoes of some form or other. So there's a really, um, and, and uh, I don't know if it's, you know, the two were a wampum or a, or a, or a, a crash. I, I love this idea that the only one that can move is the canoe, which is true about Canada. That's the canoe. All of us who've canoed know it's the only viable veins of transport unless on the waters in many, many cases. And um, I, 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 love the, I love this sort of, uh, it's gonna, something's going to happen and nobody understands what it is. And there's a lot of misunderstanding. Already you can see the, the misunderstandings. And the kind of assurance of the Minotaur, which it, it, it's like the Champlain statue in Ottawa, where Champlain's up on the hill pointing, like, you know, European romantic, right, up the Ottawa River, which is the way into the center of the continent. And he's saying in the statue, you know, come on, boys, that way. Whereas what he's really saying is he's looking over his shoulder to the, the people who've invited him to get in the canoes, probably a wine dots, and saying, where the hell are we going and what is that? You know, so it's a, it's a very interesting, the self-assurance, which is the foolishness, foolishness of the Minotaur for me. I don't know, does any of that make sense? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this for me uh, makes me really happy because when people can read into the painting like that and pull things out and pull these layers of meaning out, it really resonates uh, in term, with my own intentions. Um, and uh, so that, that, that's, it's just nice to hear that. Can I add one other thing? No. And that, and, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> the, you, know, uh, you know, there was a show in uh, New York in 1984, was, I always forget the name of it, a very important show. Do you remember this? Primitivism, Primitivism and Modernism. And Primitivism and Modernism, and it was a very scandalous show. At the MoMA. You're, you've read about this, you're too young to know I've about it. I've written about it. You've <laughs> written about it. So you may not agree, but my memory of it is that this was the first show that actually had Picasso and Brock and everybody else, and beside them were all these sculptures, etc., coming from Africa and the Pacific, and, and I think on both coasts and things. And the art historians went nuts because they said, well, I mean, this is European art. It's not derivative of primitive art, right? And, and, and it, so it was a very interesting moment, this realization, because there were the photographs of 
Picasso with his painting and the mask beside it, right? And, and, and so in a funny kind of way, I feel that, you know, Ken, in some of these historical paintings in this one, is turning that whole thing on its head. Like he's, he's saying, well, I'm, I've, I'm taking advantage of a very interesting but primitive school in Europe and making it indigenous art. Well, that was my thinking. I mean, a number of years ago, people were like, uh, you know, they would ask me, what is your work like expecting it to be woodland school or what have you? And then I would show them these paintings, which are very much from a European tradition of painting. And, uh, you know, in my own thinking, I was making it a Cree tradition. I was making, I was making a Cree painting. Mm -hmm. It's about your worldview that is in the work itself. It's not the actual medium itself. I mean, Cree playwrights write uh, plays. They write symphonies and 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 uh, and operas and it's the medium itself is really just the vehicle through which you express your worldview so um, it, I, I like that it sort of disrupts uh, and 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 challenges I think those perceptions that people have about the kind of work an indigenous person is supposed to make it's, it's a bit like Thompson Highway inverting mm -hmm. the classic big play you, you probably don't know Thompson Highway you know well, he's Cree, Northern Cree, Northern Manitoba, and he's famous for particularly two plays, gigantic plays. There, there are three acts, I think, both of them. Dry Lips Ought to Go to Capus Kaysen and... Um, Res Sisters. Sisters. Uh, Res Sisters. They are, like, like uh, incredibly funny and cruel and massive. And they're, you, they're very hard to read because they're essentially oral. And on stage, they're just overwhelming masterpieces. And it is the same thing. It's the, it, it taking a European form and it, making the indigenous dominate it. Really, re you would love them, actually. I think it's also about the location of culture. So when somebody else is in power, they kind of decide where your culture's located, right? Like if it's in a bead or if it's in a feather or where it's located. Um, I think artists, generally, they decide where their culture is located. So if you... You, wouldn't, you don't see it as a European painting, actually. You see it as a Cree painting, which is sort of locating the culture where you would want to locate it, which is in a more complex place, which relates to what you were talking about in terms of indigenous art history and how it's been sort of located in the museum. Um, thinking about putting all those masks, as you were talking earlier, in a boat, traditionally that wouldn't have been done. Bill Reed is the first person to kind of do that, and you're taking that even further. So there's a way in which art itself has this kind of role to kind of push culture around a little and <laughs> open it up. Would you say that? Well, for sure. And I mean, uh, we influence each other. So there's a, there's a back and forth exchange that has been happening for a really long time. So, you know, we don't live in bubbles, and we never have. So, um, you know... Uh, there, there was a, a, a metaphorical way of resurrecting a dead tradition of painting to say that, you know, uh, a, a through line to history and tradition is important, so don't wipe ours out. So I think, you know, by flipping it around and saying, look, here's a valuable, very valuable form that you have kind of walked away from, um, I see value in that, but I can see value in it because I'm an outsider looking at it and saying, this is, this is really good stuff. Why aren't you guys looking at this anymore? You know, so that, that was kind of my take on it. That's funny. The first show that I curated of Kent was called Res Erection. <laughs> <laughs> well, you nodded when she said, oh, is it a Cree painting? Is it a Cree painting or is it a Kent Monkman painting who uses and plays with whatever he enjoys to use and to play with. And there are Cree elements and European elements and history painting elements, etc., etc., etc. So is it a Cree painting? Well, I've just said that in a way to sort of uh, make it my own. So the, I'm using the medium to express my own point of view. I want to open it up to the audience. Are there questions in the audience? We don't have a lot of time left, so the burning ones do it. Hi, I just had a question around, I guess, mischief and what I'm assuming based on the smaller painting is Jesus and they're sort of both off center in the paintings and mischief, as you said, is rising from a dream and again, from what I can see, Jesus has been taken down off the cross. So was there a symbol there around 
them being the, the spiritual center of the canoe and of the other ship? Um, well, I, I guess, you know, you make, you make certain decisions sometimes just instinctively, and uh, sometimes it's just about uh, solving uh, problems uh, with the composition, too. So, you know, I wanted Miss Chief, of course, to be the star of this painting, and, uh, uh, you know, as the painting kind of uh, further deepens in its uh, tonal ranges and stuff, I'll try and sort of, you know, get the spotlight right on her, but um, it was really just about um, wanting to uh, have her take a central role in this sort of sprawling scene. Um, but uh, a lot of it is just, you know, figuring out the composition and, and, and making those choices sometimes instinctively and then working through them. We had a question on this side as well. Hi, I'm Jay. I have two questions. One, it's easy to see the variety historical variety on the European side. Uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the diversity of characters in the, in the canoe. I don't see that as clearly as I should. Second one is, um, I'm just I'm kind of wowed by the whole concept of you having all the, all the apprentices, and I'm amazed at the detachment of someone who can allow the brush strokes of other, of other people. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a writer and I go back to look at my own writing and just even with my own stuff, I can't believe that that idiot, you know, did, <laughs> you know, created that sentence or whatever. So I wonder, I, I, I'm curious about your, your sense of detachment and uh, to what extent you let the apprentice's work um, stay as the final statement. For sure. Well, uh, in terms of distinguishing the characters, it's still quite unfinished and I was hoping that through again through this the idea of the, th the headgear and the headdresses and the way that the different um, nations would distinguish them themselves that will become more apparent uh, as the painting gets finished that was something I was thinking about the fact that there are like you know Niska masks you know painted by Paul Kane <laughs> in the in a canoe where there's also a raven and you know so I really wanted it to rep be kind of representative but again you know it's it, it is a painting so there are limitations to what you can fit in um, the, the whole process of having assistance was uh, definitely uh, something that I had to kind of uh, go on a bit of a journey with because, of course, you know, as an artist, you become kind of, um, you're obsessed with your own uh, hand and, and uh, but, uh, you know, over the years, I've trained a number of different painters, probably about eight or, or nine by now, um, some of them who have already moved on, but... Um, that became a really uh, valuable and interesting uh, project for me to entertain in my own practice because it also uh, improved my own practice because it forced me to articulate exactly what I was doing. So I would have to analyze exactly what I was doing and why. Which brush do I use to do this and why? And so uh, just being able to articulate and, and in fact, I, I've, I've barely touched this painting so far. That is through the orchestration of many hours of me directing my assistants through all the different steps required to get it to this point. Um, very specific things that have to do with the, the, um, the size of the brush, the kind of brush, how you load the paint on the brush, how you drag that paint across the canvas. Very, very specific technical things that I had to really understand myself in order to teach people how to do it. And it's physically impossible for me to make a painting like this uh, you know, in less than 10 years, unless I have a staff to help me do it. So it was really good in terms of understanding my own process well enough to be able to explain it to people who are at different levels of their own artistic uh, journey as well. So very, you know, sort of emerging artists that have, have moved very quickly in terms of their, their, their ability to, to understand and, and process because th no one ever told them how to actually paint. So in my studio, it's really different than being in, a, in an institution like OCAD or anywhere else, because no one can really tell you how to paint. You have to they kind of guide you. But in my studio, there's a very regimented way of making a painting. And there's a very regimented way of loading your palette. And, and so the, the, you know, the more senior the assistant, the more they can actually pyramid down, like train the, the newbies. So uh, it's, it's been a really, uh, yeah, it's been a really amazing, um, process to, to, to teach people how to do that. Now, you know, uh, the medium-sized one, I've spent a lot of time on that one because there's so much uh, a resolution that had to be brought to that and the, the study I did entirely by myself. Um, and then this, uh, for me, uh, it, that's only about 40% finished in my mind because I still have to come in and, 
and really put the, the layers on top. But, you know, through that, I'm, I'm also watching them daily. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I leave it for a day or two and I just give them direction and then I come back and I'm like, oh, that's really good, but it needs to be darker, it needs to be cooler, it needs to be this, or it needs to be that. And it's been really helpful just un understanding my own, uh, my own process. It's interesting because when we first met, it was at the Imaginative Film and Video Festival, and you're, when you're talking, it sounds so much like filmmaking and the process of creation in that way. But also, the big European masters also used assistants and apprentices and everything like that. It's been going on forever, I think. I mean, I think it's worth adding, A, to what you said, which is European painting, massive painting, and church painting has always been based on the painter controlling and having a large number of people helping them. There's, I don't think there's an exception to that rule. I mean, whether it's Giotto or, you know, or, or Delacroix or Rubens, they, they all directed people uh, and doing it. And, um, and I think the way you've just described it, this control over how to use the brush in your studio, and, and that makes perfect sense to me. It's very different from the individual writer where, you know, it, it's a very, very different kind of process. But there not there also a very interesting link with an, the indigenous tradition, and I might say this wrong, in which case correct me, but w the way I've always been told it by, by indigenous great artists is, and, and by, well, by most people, which is there isn't this idea that, well, that's the artist, you know, and that's the businessman, and that that everybody feels they have a role in art, but everybody knows who the great artist is. So that there isn't this kind of exclusion that there is in Western society today. Oh, well, only the artist you know, can touch the canvas. And I, I mean, I remember Ada and I were on Haida Gwaii, and it was Jim Hunt, wasn't it? Yeah, we're up in the north of Haida Gwaii, and Jim Hunt, one of the great artists, uh, Haida artists, was doing a new totem pole, which would take forever. And everybody in the community was coming out and carving with him. But boy, was he controlling it. And I and, and can tell you, and he said to Adrian and I, would you like to do a bit of carving? But we were put to the task of the lowest of the low, I can tell you, because he knew he didn't have time to teach us to do anything intelligent. So we just sort of removed a bit of wood, you know, that would later be dealt with by someone more skilled. So I think that idea of the uh, you know, this is the opposite of the romantic creator idea, where it's only me, it's only my heart and soul that's at play. Instead, it's much more in those two European and, I think, indigenous traditions. Well, I think there is this idea that art is part of everyday life and everybody gets to partake in some kind of sense of creativity in the community. But as you said earlier, there is the artist, the one that's the master of the beating or the master, the one that you go to because they're the kind of the, the greatest at it. Um, I don't think you would see yourself quite like, I don't think, I think you think of yourself as an artist. So let maybe start there. Well, yeah, I mean, I, but I also get a lot uh, uh, out of working and collab. I, I see my, my studio as a collaborative environment. So, uh, yeah, there's a bit of the, the top-down stuff because there is a point where they can't do anything unless I'm there weighing in on it. But, um, you know, I, I, I choose talented young people and um, really encourage a lot of um, collaboration. So they're, they're bringing ideas to the table and they're also bringing their own skills and their own... Um, their own creativity and you know because I work I don't just make paintings I make you know uh, film and video and installation and there's a lot of things and so I've, I'm very fortunate in that um, having a team also gives such energy uh, to uh, my practice because it's never static and it's always not always reliant on my level of energy sometimes I'm just like I'm burned out and I, I'm just not able to produce that that day, but my studio is in full effect. You know, there's uh, eight of us, eight eight assistants now. So we're, you know, we're we're very busy, and and that having that energy always present really gives me more energy back. So it's really uh, a back and forth. It's beautiful. And, yeah. Sorry, did you want to say any more? Uh, are there more questions from the audience? I think we have one right here. Um, it's not really a, uh, Oh, it's or not really a, a question. It's more of a comment answering uh, back to uh, 
to Bernard's question of is it a Cree painting or is it a Kent Monkman painting? Um, I'm a Filipino Canadian person and I, I make rock music. Um, but is it white music or is it Filipino music? Because I wrote it, you know, and especially when I, I'm telling stories of my parents' migration from the Philippines. And suddenly, there's not just a white audience listening to this rock music. Suddenly, there's young Filipino women washing in the front, you know? And especially in a conference that's speaking about inclusion and talking about, is this a Cree painting? Is it a European painting? You know what, when I go to the AGO and I see these paint, like 15, 16, 17th century paintings, and I'm appreciating the technique, I'm like, okay, I'm tired of this story. And I see Kent's painting, and it's telling another story, which is, you know, an indigenous perspective, an indigenous story, and it's opening up like the audience and who's included in like appreciating and looking at the art and who's being represented. So, you know, one day when Kent Monkman is dead, it's still going to be a Cree painting with a Cree audience inspiring young Cree artists and other, you know, artists of all kinds who don't feel included when they go to this gallery and see these white paintings. So I think yes. you're right. It is it is about narrative and what like what kind of stories that art is telling. And I know you started to touch on that, Kent, but do you want to talk a little bit more about the importance of narrative in your work and the stories that you're telling? Well, you know, I mean, a large part of my work over the last 20 years has been exploring, you know, uh, why and, and how and for all the reasons uh, indigenous perspectives were essentially, you know, not included in, in the telling of art the art history of North America, and we know why, is a European settler version that exists in all our museums and that still continues to uh, feed how museums represent not just that version, but um, how indigenous people fit into it. Now, we've had a lot of forward movement in Canada, more than in, in the United States, and I go to the, the, the States often, and I I you know do projects with museums, but I feel like they're a generation behind. They're, they're you know, you were talking earlier about um, just how do you how do you work with allies? Well, allies give the space to the indigenous people to have their voice, not not you know curate the shows for them. So it's made such a huge difference in Canada to see indigenous people working as curators in museums and institutions. That is where we're seeing the big shift. Um, and you know, people will, will you know, institutions move very slowly. I mean, someone could 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 be in a position for 20, 25 years in a, in an institution, and then that's really problematic. That chokes off m uh, momentum and movement. Um, and that's what I see happening in in the United States is that they're still doing this top down kind of form of representation and curating of in, in, of, of indigenous stories, but it has got to shift because it's not going to move and really shift how. Uh, indigenous narratives are, are represented in, in museums. May I ask you, I found very interesting what you said, how teaching your apprentices makes you think about what you're actually doing, how you brush and how you pick up the paint. <clears throat> I don't know how Rembrandt did it with his apprentices. Did he just do that or did he also tell them, oh, in this corner I need something, I think a saint should go there and then the apprentice goes and paints the saint or whether it was just uh, fill out what I have designed. So how is it for you? Is it just filling out what you have designed or could you also imagine saying to one of your apprentices, well, I want a horse there, so put a horse on the raft. No, that's a uh, that's a little too loose. Like I, I still I'm I still still have quite a bit of control. And and then with 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 the with the I think what was useful here is seeing that seeing that course of of this image kind of come from that little sketch to the the study because that really shows you you know the how how it came to be. Now um, there are sometimes there there are things where I, I give them a little more room, and I think you know if, uh, filmmaking is uh, for me is a little more collaborative in that way. Um, but uh, when it comes to a painting, I, I'm I'm very specific about it, and you know the the one character at the front of the canoe there with the the paddle, uh, I think that's the third time he's been painted, <laughs> because the first two times it just didn't work, and I was like it's got to get painted uh, again, and so. Um, you know, I still have, a, I still retain a lot of uh, very specific control um, when it comes to that. And um, 
I think my, uh, my assistants, they are there and they understand that they're not there to put their own point of view in my work. They're there basically to paint and to, they want to paint the way I want them to paint. So and that's their job. And, and the ones that do well in my studio uh, really understand that and the ones that don't get fired. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. We have a question out here from Giselle. First of all, I just want to acknowledge the work that Wanda Nanabush has done as an incredible curator here at the AGO. Like, we're all really grateful for your perspective and what you brought. Thanks. Um, and, uh, but uh, getting back to um, Kent's work, I think we haven't really talked enough about the sexiness of this uh, painting and your work in general. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the use of um, sex and the power dynamics of politics and history and also uh, humor and its relationship to Cree storytelling. Well, you know, uh, sexuality was such an important part of um, the, the early work that I did in this direction, you know, with cowboys and Indians. And, you know, they were like basically just very erotic images. And for me, that was about really wanting to uh, present a very empowered sexuality. You know, indigenous people, we've been institutionalized, we've been colonized, we've had our sexuality uh, repressed, uh, the traditions of, of, of two-spirit people, of, of the Berdash, of the, you know, the gender, the third gender, you know, stamped out by the church. I, I, I really wanted to have a very empowered sexual persona in the persona of Miss Chief. And, She's, uh, you know, unabashedly, um, you know, saucy, and um, she's she's very powerful in, in in terms of you know her own sexuality, and um, so in in this image specifically, I mean, I kind of I know I, it's called two ships, but it really is Miss Chief's wet dream, and it, <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just for my it's for myself. You know, as I think about this, no, I, I, I really, um, it's, it's, it's about, you know, the, our, 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 our dream world too, and just being able to dream positivity and to, 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 to um, imagine ourselves as uh, powerful um, people. And uh, our sexuality is so deeply embedded in who we are as human beings, you know, and it's part of our, it's part of our tradition of storytelling too. There's very sexual stories in our in our uh, Wasaga Chuck stories, and you know, um, so the sexuality is super important. Funnily enough, those bells aren't very sexy. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> Miss Ch Miss. Thank you for visiting the AGA, and we look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> I love other people getting involved in other people's titles. Uh, actually, Miss Chief's Dream, no, not Wet Dream, Miss Chief's Dream would be a wonderful title for this. Wet. Say it, say it. <laughs> say it, no. John. Say wet. No, say no, it. I don't mind saying say wet, it. dream. It's wet Dream. It's a seascape. It's, it's, they're in water. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. What were you thinking? <laughs> No, I think actually Miss Chief's dream is that idea, you want to make her the center of it. In a way, that makes her the center of it because she's dreaming this whole thing, you know? The whole thing is her dream. And it, then she becomes this very powerful, powerful figure. Sorry, I didn't say anything, forget it. But there is a direct relationship, I think, that you're pulling out which, uh, between col colonialism and the suppression of sexuality, right? So. I think to look at indigenous forms of sexuality, which are quite diverse, it can be quite liberating for the whole colonial project. Like, it could liberate everybody. <laughs> okay, we're going over here. I know Kant's work from years and uh, loved visiting the studio and seeing everything. And of course, Miss Chief is this hugely powerful sexual symbol. And she's particularly powerful in your videos. But where she comes to her apogee for me, and I think in many ways for you, Kent Monkman, as Canadian artist, is her performance 
before the Fathers of Confederation. And there she is dancing in front of the Fathers of Confederation, lying down. It wasn't she lying down or she dancing? Perching. On a Perching, Perching provocatively. Um, so that you are attempting, it seems to me in that, to give a view of our nationhood or uh, our confederation, which we're celebrating this year, 150 years, which contextualizes it in a, in a sexual way, which we, of course, in history don't do. We don't think of anything in terms of our history, in terms of, of sexual either domination or in sexual urges or anything like that. And that's what you bring to the history. That's what you bring to your massive piece at the entrance of the, of the new uh, Museum of Fine Art in, in Montreal with the wolf and, and, and enchantment. Everything is there, the whole fresco, but it's all eroticized. So it makes me think of a real, a kind of mainstream that we have in Canadian art and, and letters, which is not all that much recognized. It's in Leonard Cohen's Beautiful Losers, which I'm sure you've read and interiorized. Um, and it's, it's in the Automatis refuse, Refugal, when they look for magic, for art. If that isn't sexual, I don't know what is. And so that's the tradition you're in. You're not a Cree artist in that sense, attempting to look at Canadian history. You are in the mainstream of what Canadian art is doing. And you're trying to energize it in this particular way. And the fact that you are mischief and that you play mischief, and that we see you as mischief, and we see you as mischief in the videos, and we see you performing mischief, is of course even greater, a greater impact, because you, the artist, are not just portraying it, but you are it. Hmm? So you're mainstream, dominant, and full of <laughs> urges. Well, you know, I wanted Mischief to be uh, a little bit dangerous, you know, when I created her because I wanted her to disrupt this very static sort of safe version, which uh, for me has all these uh, submerged layers that, you know, don't get uh, talked about. And the, the fact that, you know, I came, across a, I came across a George Catlin painting and it was this uh, painting called Dance to the Bear Dash and it was a ritual honor dance of men uh, dancing to that male who lived as a female and it was honoring her. And I thought, well, what happened? What happened to our, our own communities? What happened to you know, society at large that this has been so repressed and stamped out? Um, so I wanted Miss Chief to be, to be that provocateur to really go in and, and, and uh, you know, sex it up. How about Miss Chief's very wet dream? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ooh, look or, at you or, go now. I'm, I'm trying to get beyond the single erection to something larger. Or, or, now we're going for wet, multiple or, erections. Or the wetness of Miss Chief's dream. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> There's something in there. I just don't know. <laughs> yeah, we will help you find out. Um, so on that very wet note, I think <laughs> we have to bring this session to a close. But uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to discuss this painting with you. Kent Monkman, and also Bernard and John. Uh, thank you. So thank, thank you, you all for coming. Yeah. Oh, eight. Just want to uh, ask the people who are up on the stage to please stay up. Would we just like to take a few photographs? If we have a photographer, we don't know that we have a photographer. Anyone wants to take pictures? <laughs> Do we have a photographer in the house?